From WNIN News, this is the Friday Wrap. I'm John Gibson. On today's show, we welcome Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press to talk about a proposal for a new firehouse in Evansville. We'll listen back to Tim Jagalow's feature on the economic impact of colleges and universities. WNIN's Kenton McDonald speaks with Indiana Public Broadcasting's Aubrey Wright about a new law requiring intellectual diversity in classrooms. Jevin Redmond will join us for the sports chat and we'll run down the weekend notebook. The Friday Wrap is next on WNIN-FM with support from Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations following the news from NPR. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Good to have you along on this Friday. Well, Evansville's fire chief would like to see a new fire station built on the city's east side. Mayor Stephanie Terry is seeking $375,000 in the next city budget to get the project started. Joining me now is Sarah Lesh, who covers local government for the Evansville Courier and Press. Sarah, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great to have you here. Uh, well, now, you, you talked to uh, Fire Chief Tony Knight. Uh, can you tell us why he thinks the city needs a new firehouse? Sure. So it's it's a mix of things. Um, it's mm-hmm. both age of current fire stations, um, along with response times, which they have um, a response times that are pretty much set for them. Like what's a what's a good response time? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the new fire station, from what Chief Knight has said, will address both of the issues of older buildings as well Mm -hmm. as getting a quicker response time for basically exact opposite ends of the city um Mm -hmm. and so that that's sort of his hope and his reason for for bringing it about but it has been an issue too that um sort of outlives his status as chief um it's something that came up during the budget sessions last year um and i know age of the fire stations has kind of been a continued conversation over the years so right right. now yeah as we mentioned some of the uh current uh, fire stations are are getting a little old uh some go back many decades um but we're talking about here not replacing any of those existing stations actually building a whole new one right yes so this doesn't you know involve taking out a chunk of a building and adding something brand new or you know tearing one down even and Mm -hmm. building up from the ground they're going to find a completely new location um and build something from the ground up yeah yeah well speaking of location and that seems to be uh quite the question at this point exactly uh, where a new uh, fire station might go uh, what do we know about uh, that, uh, you know, that location question? Sure. So he, when he spoke to Evansville City Council, and again, um, I double checked with him about, you know, not putting out a location at this point. So until they have it secured, he said he doesn't want to give out like the desired location um, until they they know that they can get it or they right. have it. Um, and so the general location, I'm going to look to make sure that I give you right, sure. built somewhere between Van Avenue and Green River from the Lloyd Expressway to Washington. So mm. that's sort of the box that it could be in um but nothing really you know nothing about is it a vacant lot is it an old business is it nothing Mm -hmm. like that that we know yet yeah now we were talking before we went on the air that there's a a fire station not too far from there hose house 16 Mm -hmm. is on washington avenue between bakey and van uh so uh, you know uh, it, it strikes me that that's a little close Perhaps that implies that it will be somewhere further north in that box you just spoke of. Sure, it could. I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it could. Well, you mentioned the response times. Uh, mm-hmm. And I guess the idea here is that adding a station somewhere in that area on Evansville's east side uh, would improve uh, response times in, in two places, basic, two parts of town, basically. Yes, uh, yes. Now, how would, that, uh, how would that happen, according to the uh, fire chief? 
So currently, um, the Plaza Park area and Arcadian Acres are getting a full response in about seven and a half minutes. An eight-minute response is like the very base of what's considered acceptable. Mm. Um, And so with the new station, uh, Chief Knight said that they'll be able to bring that response time down to about five and a half minutes. Mm. So the new station would house a ladder, an engine, and the East Side Battalion chief. And so that it will also help the west side of town. Um, It'll help by allowing the ladder from the downtown station to move to the west side. And so just like with Plaza Park and Arcadian Acres, the Howell Howell neighborhood has Mm. the same issue with response time. So they have a seven and a half minute full complement response um, and they'll be able to bring that down to five and a half as well due to the moving of the Yeah, in other words, yeah, the ladder from Hose House 1 downtown would then be also serving the yes. west side. Yes. It wouldn't be physically moving, correct? We're talking- I don't believe so. No, um, no. I believe it'll stay there, but it'll be able to assist um, for, for the west, west side, side as runs, opposed yeah. to assisting the east. Or- I got you. I got you. Uh, we should probably point out now, uh, we talked about response times. I believe, uh, for example, out in the Arcadian Acres, you, you do have a nearby firehouse there, Hose House 6. Mm-hmm. So I, I believe the parameters are you, you, you want at least to have a, an engine on the scene within four minutes is that right yes so the the basis is four minutes of a response time for an initial truck mm-hmm. and then what i was discussing as far as the full complement response right. is that eight minutes at the maximum for that to happen and so that's three engines a ladder a rescue squad and an incident commander so right. what you might think of when you think of a full response to a fire all of those trucks on scene yeah right right and they come from all various parts of right. uh, the, the the neighborhood yes we're speaking with sarah lesh of the evansville courier and press this is the friday wrap i'm john gibson and we're talking with sarah about uh, this proposal uh, to get some money in the budget to begin work on a new fire station uh, somewhere on Evansville's east side is uh, what we've uh, talked about here. Uh, We should point out historically, uh, uh, Sarah, I know that uh, the EFD took on more territory uh, more than 10 years ago now when the Knight Township Fire Department was shut Mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Uh, So so as I understand it too, the uh, Evansville Fire Department now responds to runs further east than they used to as well, which, mm-hmm. again, I guess sort of spreads out that whole thing and perhaps uh, makes some of those response times a little, uh, a little, uh, a little longer than maybe they, they'd rather be. Uh, and speaking of history, uh, how long has it been, I believe you, you noted this in your story, how long has it been since a new firehouse has opened in Evansville? So the newest station um, opened in 1998, um, and it was replacing a station that was built in the 50s. So the newest station, you know, many years ago now at this point, I guess. (laughs) At this point, yeah, more than 25 (laughs) years More than 25 years, and it was replacing something from the 50s. So um, you can look at that time span of how long it took them to replace something from the 50s. So this one of adding something new – you know, has been quite a while since 98 as well. So Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about those concerns about the conditions at the existing stations. Uh, what did uh, Chief uh, Knight have to say about all that? Sure. So um, a lot of the stations, majority of them at this point were 60s, 70s, 80s. That's when they were built. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you think about the city now versus the city in the 60s, especially 70s to 80s, there's quite a bit of a difference um, in the way it looks, the way neighborhoods and communities are built up, um, more people in general and all of those things. So the stations were built for those those decades Mm -hmm. um and so they were built in a way that you know things age out of working the way that they should with Mm -hmm. especially with something like firefighting where everything they're getting new stuff every year that like makes the job easier and all of those sorts of things so um maintenance has been a discussion as well along with the addition of an entirely new fire station they've also upped the budget request for 2025 the city has um, and the fire department of course themselves too mm-hmm. um, from I think it was two hundred thousand dollars this past year and they're asking for five hundred thousand for 2025 so um, that you know 
I can't say exactly all of the things that would go into just general maintenance of a firehouse, but obviously just regular building management and upkeep, those sure. sorts of things that, that keep it okay for the firefighters to be there in constant shifts, of yeah. course, and then for keeping equipment and materials safe within the building. Yeah. Any, have there been any specifics uh, on what firehouses may get replaced uh, in the uh, near future? Yeah, so there hasn't been any discussion of new fire stations aside from this one that's discussed. So nothing has come before council, um, the city council, and nothing came up in conversations with the mayor or um, Chief Knight. And so I would say at this point, this is probably the one that we're looking at for this budget cycle. Um as you can imagine, major builds like that are not cheap. And so right. like this $375,000 that's budgeted in is for, you know, soil testing and site development, things that are not going to include the cost of the full building. Right. Um, so future fire stations could, of course, be a thing. If we're talking about aging infrastructure, that's a common idea in yes, the city indeed. and so putting thing new things in place is is always coming up in budgets but probably i would imagine quite spaced out yeah now uh, has there been any talk of actual closing of stations you, you mentioned how the the city is 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 different than it was mm-hmm. uh 30 40 years ago populations have moved around uh is there any talk of perhaps closing a station or two I have not heard anything on closings at this point. Um, I, I really think that they're they're still servicing all of these areas that they're in, of course. And mm-hmm. the the ad or the need to add something um, has not come with a desire to close anything at this yeah, point. Yeah, uh, we might remember, I believe, back in the 1990s, there was a proposal to to close a couple of uh, stations in Evansville, and that was met with a lot of uh, surprise mm-hmm. and uh, and obviously opposition from uh, neighbors uh, neighborhoods where the those uh, fire stations uh, were located. Well, we, you touched on this a bit, but what kind of timeline are we looking at here? First, as you say, there has to be this preliminary work. And uh, so h- how long might it be before we actually see a new uh, fire station opening up? Sure. So at this point, I I cannot say anything concrete about when the station itself would be. Um, it is budgeted this work for 2025. And so we also have to get through the rest of the budget process where sure. this would hypothetically be accepted. So obviously the, the city council still has the ability to say, we don't want to put quite this much in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that sort of thing, or have a discussion about any of the, the timeline moving forward. Forward. They could vote to, to put it in for another budget year. Um, at this point, they seem pretty on board with the conversations. The understanding is there about mm. what the fire department is dealing with as far as their infrastructure. Um, but budget approval, I believe, is in early October. Um, mm. And so that would still be another month from now before we even know if the money itself is approved. Um, and then I wouldn't expect any work to begin until 2025. And then from there, pass the soil and site testing and all of those things i yeah. i don't know when we could actually see shovels in the ground for building right right uh, and of course you're you're covering the budget process uh, mm-hmm. for the courier and press uh can you tell us a little bit about how that's coming along do we know of uh, of things that are at this point in the budget and out of the budget and that kind of thing sure so um the city council has had their budget hearings um Uh, where the department heads come and present. They had joint hearings um, for the departments that are joint with the county. So um, building commission, animal control, departments like that, that are both a city and a county venture. Those just occurred this week. Hmm. Um, And so they they are still, you know, it's not early, early in the process. They've got through all of those <laughs> those hearings with right, the individual right, department heads, hearings, but yeah. yes. But um, they do still have some time. They'll have they'll have a meeting with budget cuts where they have their discussion. City councilors can bring amendments to, hey, we want to move this amount of money here, this amount of money here. Right. Um, the city council can deduct from the budget, but they can't add to it. Hmm. And so there, there won't be anything necessarily getting bigger unless they choose to move something right, right. Um, but they're right now we'd be looking ahead at also the public hearing where the public can come in and discuss the budget itself sure. during the during the department head hearings that's open to the public to be there but it's not um, something where they take comment during that time so yeah. that will still be upcoming I believe that is the second meeting
meeting in September, um, mm-hmm. which currently I can't think. Maybe the 23rd, is that meeting? Uh, that's, um. <laughs> uh, that could be. I, I don't have the calendar in front of me. But yeah, and, uh, the second meeting of the yes, month would be yes. uh, that public hearing. And folks can come and say what they think of these uh, budget ideas, mm-hmm. right, and where they'd like to see the money spent. All right. Well, Sarah, anything else to add that we haven't touched on here? I don't think so. Um, like you said, I'm, I'm covering the budget, so we're doing some pull-out stories on individual things like this fire station that we did. Mm-hmm. Um, and for people wanting to participate in the public hearing and things like sure, that, sure. we'll have information as it gets closer about how to do that. So mm-hmm. other than that, I think that's all I have. Yeah. That is Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press. You can find her stories at courierpress.com. Sarah, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. We certainly appreciate that. Well, coming up, we'll hear from WNIN's Tim Jagolo. He took a look at the economic impact of colleges and universities on uh, the communities in which they stand. We'll hear more about that coming up, and Tim will join us as well on the Friday Wrap. I'm John Gibson. Hope you can stay with us. Hey, it's Dan Martinez from Morning Edition. There's some things in life that really just don't change, such as waking up with a cup of coffee in the morning, weekly grocery runs, or picking up the kids from school. Well, listening to Morning Edition with local host John Gibson or All Things Considered with Kenton McDonald is just like that, too. In the morning, on the way home, or over the weekend, WNINFM is here for you. It's radio you rely on. Renew your support, make an additional gift, or donate for the very first time today at WNIN.org. And thanks. What do our secrets say about ourselves? Can math solve gender inequality? How was money invented? Hi, I'm Chris Boyd, host of Think. These are the types of questions my guests and I explore every day on our show for a full hour. Because you listen to WNIN 88.3, I know you have an inquisitive mind of your own. Join me Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. as we sit down, get curious, and take a moment to think. Listen to Think at 10 a.m. on WNIN 88.3. Attention high school students. Want to make a difference in your community and win cash prizes? WNIN and the Evansville Climate Collaborative invite you to join the Anti-Idling Campaign Contest. Create a public service video or design a parking lot sign that raises awareness about the harmful effects of vehicle idling. Your creativity can help protect our environment and promote responsible driving. The top entries will win up to $1,000. Submit your entry by November 1st and visit WNIN.org for details. Coming this fall on the Food From Here podcast, we hear from the owners of Turntable, the catering company that's found a new home at Arcademy in downtown Evansville. We also meet the owners of Earthrise Farm, who raise gorgeous chilies in Posey County. And Amanda bradshaw Burks comes by to talk about all the good things Purdue Extension is doing to support growers in our community. I'm your host, Peggy Pirro. Look for the new season of Food From Here starting September 10th, sponsored by Swerka and More and their intergenerational community garden partnership with Young and Established. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Good to have you along on this Friday. Well, colleges and universities not only educate students and employ staff members, they also have an economic effect on the surrounding community. WNIN's Tim Jagolo has this report. Honeymoon Coffee, a coffee shop right across from the University of Evansville, is experiencing a rush of students. Sierra Ritter is making a fall-themed cold brew drink. Joelle? This little strip of businesses right on Weinbach Avenue draws college students for the pizza, the Chinese food, and the coffee. Tia Tolbert is a grad student in the physical therapy department. She's on her tablet on a couch working on a gross anatomy exercise. I would say like a lot of local and small businesses get a lot of support for our um, through college students just because of their um, like locations and like where these colleges and universities from time to time will publish a report in detail on how they affect the local communities. 
and most of that is linked to supporting or creating jobs. UE completed their study, like many others, in 2020. The Economic Analysis Report says UE attracted more than 114,000 visitors and added $144 million to the Indiana economy. The statewide community college, Ivy Tech, has also reported directly and indirectly supporting jobs. That was pre-pandemic, though. What's going on now in the post-pandemic? We're, we're back from pre-pandemic numbers in terms of our enrollment, um, our budget as well. That's Chancellor Daniela Vidal from Ivy Tech Community College, Evansville. Their operational spending is now surpassing pre-pandemic levels. They spent more than $23 million in 2018 to 2019 and about $24.5 million now. Payroll spending is also comparable. So we can safely say that a lot of these numbers at this point um, would be representative. The point of mentioning payroll and spending is that those dollars create a ripple effect beyond the college itself, such as an estimated 3,700 jobs supported by Ivy Tech in their economic analysis. UE reportedly supported 1,300 jobs. Can I get a piece of spinach and a piece of cheese? School is back at UE and business is picking up, says Slice Pizza Shop owner Tom Rail. I've seen an uptick here lately uh, since school started. Uh, last year, not so much, but this year, yes, definitely. Uh, we're, we're starting to see an uptick. You said they order DoorDash a lot? They do. Okay. Yeah, DoorDash is huge for them. Okay. These numbers also bear out for Honeymoon Weinbach manager Samantha Price, who is busy making food in the back. I'm making avocado toast with egg, I have an omelet going, and I have a crescent moon going, and I just got a half moon. It slows down a lot during the summer and winter, which obviously shows that students make a huge impact here. Of all the regional colleges, the most recent study was published by Western Kentucky University, just this week in fact. According to their report, WKU added $134 million in income to the five regional campus service areas, including Owensboro. That number is $528 million for the Bowling Green area. WKU spokesperson Jace Lux says it's important to share these numbers. I think it's important for the university to understand fully the impact that it is having on the region in which it's located. But I also think it's important for the region to understand the important role that colleges and universities play in their communities. And not every community has a college or university. And um, I think it, it, this demonstrates that it's a real benefit to the region, to the, the state, to support higher education and to have... For WNIN News, I'm Tim Jagalow. And Tim joins us live here on the uh, Friday Wrap. Tim, as always, thanks for joining us. No problem, John. All right. Well, a few follow-up questions here. Uh, can you tell us how these colleges uh, arrive at these numbers? Sure. And I'm going to talk about WKU specifically because okay. theirs is the most recent. I'm not going to say that they're all similar, but they probably look at similar numbers. But mm -hmm. um, So WKU looked at their 2022-2023 fiscal year. Um, and so they looked at three areas to come up with the overall picture. They looked at... Right. Uh, the Bowling Green region and the counties surrounding Bowling Green. And then, of course, uh, more interesting to us, they looked at the regional campuses, including um, the area around Owensboro. They kind of mm -hmm. looked at those regional campuses as a whole right. entity. And then they combined all of those together to come up with those numbers for the impact. Nice. And, um, you know, they wanted to determine the, the investment into the community. So they looked at payroll taxes. They looked at revenue generated by students who come to Kentucky to study. Um, and spend money, and they looked at research dollars that the university secured mm -hmm. that they brought into the state that wouldn't have otherwise existed. Right. You know, they looked at alumni. All the universities look at alumni and, and who stays there and who spends money. And then they also considered uh, the people that come to campus to visit, you know, for their theater productions, for sports, and then they spend money. Sure. And uh, WKU didn't con con conduct the study themselves. They, they uh, Lightcast, an analytics company, did their study. I see. Well, what, uh, what are some of the other details you can tell us about on these uh, studies? Well, Ivy Tech and, U and UE both did theirs based on the 2018-2019. Hmm. And it, like we said, we don't have a new study for that specifically. But, um, you know, Ivy Tech Evansville um, supposedly generated $271 million in total impact. And, and again, they looked at operational spending. They looked at student spending. They looked at alumni impact. 
for that $271 million number. Um, overall, Ivy Tech in the state, they say generated $3.9 billion in overall economic impact. Statewide. Right? Statewide, yes, mm-hmm. statewide. Um, and, you know, 56,000 jobs supported, $12 million spent in construction work. Um, and then they kind of break down those jobs, like how they, what sectors they support. And, uh, for example, 9,300 uh, health care and social services jobs, 3,700 government non-educational jobs. Um, and, and, and locally and statewide, basically they say one out of 70 jobs in Indiana is supported um, and connected via uh, Ivy Tech and its students. Hmm. Um, UE, um, mm-hmm. their study you know, suggested $73.7 million in goods and services spent during that time. And it, I think I mentioned this in the story, $144 million added to the Indiana economy. Um, one more thing I'll say is the Stone Center for Health Sciences – Mm-hmm. Did do a more recent study, right. which suggested 42.6 million in total economic impact for this region in 2022. Right, I believe we reported on that too. And again, getting back to the economic impact of colleges and universities, that was a big, uh, you know, uh, impetus for getting the, uh, the the med school down in downtown Evansville uh, because of the economic impact that you just talked about there. Uh, you mentioned uh, Ivy Tech, uh, Chancellor Daniela Vidal. Uh, she mentioned in your story, I believe, that the 2020 numbers are comparable. Uh, do we know what's changed since then? She, she does say she believes that the numbers are representative. Um, if they were to do a study now, some of them might be slightly different, but it should hold true. And, you know, from her perspective, this means that basically they're, they're, they're back to pre-pandemic levels. There may have been a dip in between. But mm-hmm. basically, it's it's comparable again. But you know, things that we all know changed. You know, uh, the prices of good and services changed. The salaries sure. changed. Stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, you know, and WKU actually didn't have a 2020 study. I asked mm-hmm. so I could compare those, like retroactively sure. compare them. They didn't have one. I see. And uh, USI also didn't have a study in general to 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 offer. So if you're wondering why, I didn't yeah, have I was going to mention. Yeah, we had no numbers from USI, but uh, you asked, and right. they. Yeah, they, they didn't have one. And, and you know, uh, UE uh, on the timeline didn't have anybody that could kind of compare me, you know, for what the impact might be yeah, currently. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Tim, anything else to add that we haven't touched on? Well, you know, it, it post-pandemic, colleges have kind of, I'm not going to say they've been on the defensive, but they have been reevaluating the, 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 the necessity of a degree and, like, the value of their degrees. And mm-hmm. the college going rate has been lower in Indiana and – you know, the 21st Century Scholars Program, you know, they're at least in 2022, half the people that could have gotten free or reduced tuition don't even apply. Yeah. So when there are studies like this released, I guess it's like another way for them to say, hey, this is why colleges are important. You know, this is why we are necessary. Yeah. I'm not questioning the need for colleges. But in an era where we're not, where the pendulum has swung away from everybody going to college, mm-hmm. um, studies like this can kind of demonstrate the need for them right. in their communities. That is WNIN's Tim Jagalow. As as always, Tim, thank you for your work. Thanks for joining us today. Have a nice week off uh, yeah, next yeah. week in, in Michigan. We appreciate that. All right. Well, coming up on the Friday wrap, college students are back to school in Indiana, and uh, there's a controversial new law in place. We will hear more about that coming up on the Friday wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Hope you can stay with us. Enjoy an evening of classical music on 88.3 WNIN with Gene Noise and Classical Noise. Timeless classical music and a timeless voice from former WNIN host Gene Noise. The best of Gene Noise each weekday evening at 8 and on the weekends at midnight. Listen online with your smart speaker or on the WNIN mobile app. What is climate change? How is it affecting our lives? And what can we do about it? We'll connect the dots from energy to extreme weather, public health, the economy, agriculture, and more. This is Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz. Join me for Climate Connections, weekdays at 5.48 p.m. during All Things Considered, here on 88.3 WNIN.
This is Ari Shapiro, host of All Things Considered. Consider all the invaluable news and programs you find each day on WNIN 88.3 FM. Stories that impact your life, ideas that spark your curiosity, and news that keeps you in the know about local government, health, education, and culture. Renew your support, make an additional gift, or donate for the very first time at WNIN.org. Thanks. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Well, as you may know, college students are back to school now in Indiana with a controversial new law in place. The Indiana Senate Enrolled Act 202, which requires intellectual diversity in the classroom, and it carries stern uh, potential penalties for professors. Indiana Public Broadcasting's higher education reporter Aubrey Wright has more on how colleges are adjusting, and WNIN's Kenton McDonald spoke with Aubrey following this report. It was just before midnight. A small group of students and faculty held a candlelight vigil into the early hours of Monday at Indiana University's Sample Gates. Professor Ben Robinson, one of the organizers, said they were mourning and protesting the loss of free speech. To mark on the very first day of school, uh, to mark our determination that the speech that we cherish won't won't die. The vigil ended peacefully. A few hours later, classes were in session. Protesters took aim at a new IU policy by gathering defiantly after an 11 p.m. cutoff for expressive activity. But the group said it had another reason to mourn. Senate Enrolled Act 202. This is Professor Heather Aku. We want this campus to be a place where academic freedom is a real thing a place where racial diversity and other kinds of diversity is both welcome and honored. Governor Eric Holcomb signed SEA 202 into law last spring. It requires faculty to teach, quote, intellectually diverse ideas in the classroom. If they don't, their tenure could be in jeopardy. The law also sets up a complaint process so faculty could be reported. Diversity, equity, and inclusion programs also must support intellectual diversity. Indiana State Senator Spencer Deary wrote the policy. You know, every university is different. And so we we intentionally um, gave some mandates, but left them a little bit open-ended to allow that flexibility. SEA 202's language is vague. Deary says it's supposed to strengthen debate on campus. Some of these misconceptions out there that, oh, we need to teach the other side of, of this issue when the other side is clearly ridiculous, there, there's no mandate to do that. Boards of trustees will decide how their schools follow the law. The bill didn't really create any new powers that the Board of Trustees didn't already have. It simply tried to give them a little bit of nudge towards the right direction. Academics pushed hard against the legislation, saying this kind of political interference will lead to censorship and surveillance. Faculty members in this report can only speak for themselves, and they don't represent their universities. Here's Purdue University professor Stephanie Masta. Like, nobody wants to be an example, but somebody will be an example. Masta is worried about how this law will be enforced, because it could be weaponized against certain professors or topics. I already have colleagues who are self-censoring. According to Purdue University's interim policy, complaints about intellectual diversity are sent to HR. I do think to some to some degree that's going to be a detriment to the students because again we're experts in our research. Like Purdue IU is adopting an interim policy. Meanwhile, lawyers and faculty leaders are working on long-term changes. IU's guidance says course content doesn't need to be changed. How is this going to be implemented? And we don't know yet because it has not been. That was IU Law Professor Emeritus Alex Tanford. Tanford says there's no need for panic yet. Faculty reviews are already in place. The boards of trustees have always had authority over the university. And faculty are already sharing many ideas in the classroom. But Tanford says faculty don't trust their leaders. But again, that's fear. It's not reality yet. Indiana State University is also sorting things out. Professor Lindsay Eberman testified when the bill was being developed. And I think the hard part for us was that this bill assumed that we were already incapable of doing our work. Eberman says Indiana State's trustees passed a policy highlighting the university's strengths, including everyone's opinion in the classroom and having evidence-based evaluations. 
She says lawmakers and education leaders in the state want the same thing, students succeeding and earning valuable degrees. We just need to make sure that our legislation and our policy are in alignment with those ambitions. And she helps shape Indiana State's policy. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Aubrey Wright. And now I'm happy to be joined by Aubrey Wright from Indiana Public Broadcasting, WTIU in Bloomington on the Friday Wrap. Aubrey, thanks for taking the time today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, let's talk about this law and some of the uh, the parameters of it. Uh, first, uh, first things first, this law only applies to state universities, not private universities, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so if you've been following this story, you might remember, like, some people from private universities did speak out about it, um, specifically like Butler. But the law just singles out state educational institutions um, and their boards of trustees are all listed in the act. Um, I can rattle them off for you if you want. There's seven of them in the state. Um, certainly the biggest are Purdue, IU. Ivy Tech is still impacted even though it's a community college. Um, Ball State, Vincennes, and Southern Indiana as well. Okay. So this uh, law will impact a faculty's tenure process. Can you describe what that is for me and how this law may affect tenure for certain university professors? Yeah. Um, so tenure processes or getting tenure is kind of different for every university. Um, usually administration and faculty leaders kind of get to decide how tenure will be reviewed. They decide um, what's important in that decision. And really, hopefully, people are thinking that nothing will change. You know, every professor that I spoke to for this story were already reviewed every few years anyway. So like in very basic terms, basic, basic, <laughs> um, like tenure, people up for tenure will provide information on what they teach, what their research is, or maybe if they've done like any research project or anything like that, they document all of it. And then they have to show um, how they excel in those areas. And getting tenure is a big deal um, and it takes years to achieve. Um, but so this law is all about intellectual diversity and not going to be the only thing that's weighed when making like tenure and promotion decisions. It's just another factor in that decision. All right. So who's responsible for enforcing the law and reporting violators of the law? Yeah. So right now, it's kind of like up in the air specifically. Um, boards of trustees are working through these policies. Um, but Generally, university administration is going to decide who enforces it, you know, but up at Purdue, their interim policy says HR is going to enforce it. At IU, it will be up to, you know, maybe the academic dean. Um, so it kind of just depends on what we decide. Um, but these reporting processes are also in the works. Um, people definitely have fears that Anybody, anywhere can anonymous, anonymously report faculty, but that's being developed, being changed maybe right now. I wonder if there will be some sort of a chilling effect to this. And by that, I mean, do you suspect uh, professors or instructors may leave the state or these state institutions or uh, others may be um, uh, not coming to the state to teach at Indiana universities because of this law? Oh, uh, definitely. Um, I've spoken with, you know, younger people. I've spoken with emeritus faculty who have been at their colleges for years and years, um, and they all have that concern. Um, IU President Pamela Witten, if you remember, even spoke out about that. Um, she said that the law could damage the university's ability to compete for faculty. So I think especially for young professors and researchers who might not have a lot of confidence or, you know, relationships that could protect them, this could be a big deal for them. Um, and right now, we only have anecdotal evidence of people leaving Indiana, but this is something that's on everybody's minds in higher ed and something that everybody is going to be keeping an eye on. Do we have other states in the country that have some laws similar to this? Yeah, we do. Um, I think the most well-known ones are definitely more strict. So sometimes they're called like anti-woke laws or they'll target like critical race theory. That's a big buzzword lately. Um, 
for example, Florida has one, um, and that cuts to DEI programs. There's other ones in Texas. Um, right now, there are 50 bills around the U.S. that are trying to do something similar. They're not all laws yet, but this is definitely um, a big trend. So going forward, uh, have you heard any buzz on the university there at IU about um, you know, the first faculty member that is accused of breaking the law, what that will look like? Are there lawsuits that are uh, in place to maybe um, uh, challenge the law? Or what's the process looking like going forward um, as we start to see this thing roll out? Yeah, I definitely think that there will be more challenges to the law. Um, some Purdue professors and the ACLU of Indiana actually did try to file a lawsuit and stop SEA 202. Um, they said the law was unconstitutional, it limits their free speech, all that good stuff. Um, and the attorney general stepped in and the lawsuit basically failed. So the idea is that no one right now has lost their jobs yet and the semester just began. So it's hard to show how this law will actually harm professors. Um, it's a lot of speculation right now, and that is not a good basis for the lawsuit. But someone eventually is probably <laughs> going to be reported and punished, and it's probably going to be someone that teaches a politically charged topic like race or gender or sexuality. So mm-hmm. we're just kind of waiting to see what will happen, but I definitely think faculty will push back. Yeah, we're going to wait and see, aren't we? So, all right, that's Aubrey Wright from Indiana Public Broadcasting, WTIU in Bloomington. Aubrey, great reporting as always, and thanks for talking with me today. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back after this on the Friday Wrap. Why hasn't Indiana raised its minimum wage? How are nonprofit landlords held accountable? We've answered these questions, but we want yours as well. Join the conversation by signing up for the Indiana Two-Way. You'll receive a text to your phone every Thursday morning with questions related to statewide topics and news updates to keep you informed. To sign up, go to ipbs.org slash text. Attention high school students, want to make a difference in your community and win cash prizes? WNIN and the Evansville Climate Collaborative invite you to join the Anti-Idling Campaign Contest. Create a public service video or design a parking lot sign that raises awareness about the harmful effects of vehicle idling. Your creativity can help protect our environment and promote responsible driving. The top entries will win up to $1,000. Submit your entry by November 1st and visit WNIN.org for details. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson, and it's time for this week's Sports Chat with Jevin Redman. Jevin, as always, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Well, uh, high school football is entering uh, week three. Uh, How about a recap of last week, and what are the big games tonight? Well, the one thing we talked about last week was trying to beat the heat of such a warm Friday night last yes. week. It turned out to be a pretty nice evening, especially in the second half of those games. But mm-hmm. really no major issues with the heat last week. Oh, and good. it turned out to be an exciting you know, list of games. It was headlined by Modern Day and Castle. A bit of an upset there as Modern Day beat Castle mm-hmm. 28-24. Castle, one of those teams we thought probably in the top half, maybe a chance to compete for the right, right. regular season conference title. But uh, Modern Day was down 24-7. to They came back and won 28-24 hmm. at the Bowl and uh, their junior quarterback, Tate Mallory, threw for over 300 yards. So he had a great game. It was an awesome win for Modern Day. And another game that stood out, want to give a shout-out to Central. They had really struggled. Uh, they got their first win since October 1st of 2021. Wow. They beat Bossy 15-14 on a touchdown pass from Hunter Rochiers to Matthew Cana with 22 seconds left. Their head coach is Brandon Artis. Uh, he's in his second season, so congratulations to him, his first win at Central. Mm-hmm. Those two are the most exciting uh, games, I think, of the week. Memorial improved to 2-0. They beat North 35-14. Wrights won easily at Vincenzo 2-0. And uh, Jasper escaped Harrison 41-33 to pick up their first win. All right. Well, what are some of the big games tonight? Yeah, as far as games tonight, you look at the slate. I think uh, the most intriguing one to me is probably North at Harrison. Mm -hmm. Uh, North is winless. They're 0-2, but I think they're a pretty good team. They played two good teams to start with in Castle and Memorial. Harrison is 0-2, but I think they're much improved. Uh, They've scored 27 points and 33 points in their two losses so far. 
this year. Hmm. I think that's the best matchup on paper. Uh, maybe Jasper and Wrights at the Bull as a second one. And the other one, again, on paper should be mismatches. But, again, you never know. But those are two games that always stand out for week three. Right, right. And I understand uh, some uh, state rankings are out, correct? Yeah, so the coaches poll came out on Monday of this week and several tri-state teams in that. Headlined by Memorial in Class 3A, they're ranked first. Wow. Uh, Gibson Southern second, Heritage Hills third, Modern Day seventh, and John all four of those teams are in the same sectional in Class 3A. So wow. that, that'll be a gauntlet come October and November. But uh, Wrights is third in Class 4A, and Castle is 12th in Class 5A. Wow. All right. Well, moving on to soccer, uh, you and I both happened to see a big soccer match in Evansville uh, last Sunday, uh, the Mayor's Cup. How, how did that go? Yeah, always exciting whenever U.S. and UE play in any sport, and the Mayor's Cup has – uh, a bit of a history to it, and I thought it was a good match. Uh, Evansville won 3-1. to one. U.S. actually got the first goal of the match uh, pretty early on. Uh, mm-hmm. They led one nothing, and then Evansville scored two goals before halftime. It stayed that way until the very end as Evansville got a late goal to, to pull away and win 3-1. to one. But I thought there was a great crowd. They were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Evansville men's soccer. Mm-hmm. Had about 1,500 fans there, a lot of foreign players and coaches, and thought it was just a good night for, for both programs. And, John, real quick, I do want to mention mm-hmm. that uh, Evansville men's soccer, they won on Wednesday. Wednesday at home against Eastern Illinois. They're 4-0 for the first time since 2017. Wow. All right. Well, as we know, college football is in full swing and the NFL season is getting underway, but uh, college basketball is not too far off, is it? No. The first official practice for Division One teams really is about three weeks away. It's the end of September and then exhibition games late October. So uh, some news on that front uh, for USI, both their men's and women's full schedule has been released. The mm-hmm. OVC released the conference schedule. We've known the non-conference part for a while but uh, just some headliners with that real quick on the men's side for usi of course they're trying to bounce back after a bit of a struggle last year going eight and 24 three games that stand out there they'll play at depaul to open up the season on november 4th uh, they have games against two valley teams indiana state at home on the 25th of november mm-hmm. then at siu on december 7th on the women's side they had a tremendous season last year as right. we all know they won the regular season and also conference championship in the ovc went 25 and 7 they have quite the schedule john they will play games at louisville at IU, at Illinois, and at Murray State, plus a home game with St. Louis. So they have a very exciting hmm. non-conference schedule. Rick Stein's done a great job with that program for many years. Um, so certainly exciting come basketball season, November, December. Yeah, some big games coming up there for sure. Uh, well, uh, anything else to add, Jevin? Uh, just, I guess, to build off that, people might be wondering, well, what about the Evansville men's and women's basketball schedule? Uh, the non-conference schedule has been released, typically Valley schools get their conference schedule late because of the TV deals. They have to work that mm-hmm. out. They're kind of last in order. So we we'll anticipate that coming out in the next couple of weeks. All right. We'll be watching for that. That is Jevin Redman with uh, today's Sports Chat. As always, Jevin, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, John. And coming up on the Friday Wrap, the Weekend Notebook. Hope you can stay with us. Hey there, I'm Stephen Dubner, the host of Freakonomics Radio on WNIN every Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m. Freakonomics Radio is the show that explores the hidden side of everything. The upside of quitting, the downside of disgust, the economic impact of wolves, and the surprising ways we decide who to marry. That's Freakonomics Radio on Saturday afternoons at 3 p.m. right here on 88.3 WNIN. WNIN's listeners could be your best customers. We all find value in public radio, and research shows that 85% of listeners are more likely to take advantage of a business or service they've heard about on public radio. So if you enjoy listening to WNIN, why not invite your fellow listeners to become your customers? Call 812-423-2973 for more information. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Time now for your weekend notebook. Well, several things happening in the Evansville area this weekend. Uh, Starting with the Willard Library Better Books sale. It's continuing through Sunday at Willard Public Library on First Avenue. The ongoing sale is now in its half-price phase. The uh, sale features rare titles, first editions, yearbooks, children's books, antiques, and more. The sale is in the Browning Gallery in the library's lower level during regular library hours. Again, that's the Willard Library Better Books sale continuing through Sunday at the Historic Library on First Avenue. 
Well, it's another First Friday, and that means First Friday at Haney's Corner. The monthly event features live music, vendors, food trucks, and more. The event runs from 5.30 to 9 p.m. tonight. You can also catch Monty Skelton performing live at nearby Patchwork Central starting at 6 p.m. Again, that's the First Friday event happening in the Haney's Corner District tonight here in downtown Evansville. Also in uh, downtown Evansville tonight, Gabby Barrett is live at the Old National Events Plaza. Barrett is a rising star in the country music scene with the release of her second album, Chapter and Verse. The American Idol alum will hit the stage at Old National Events Plaza with special guest Maddox Baston at 6 p.m. Tickets range from $29 to $89. Again, that's Gabby Barrett with special guest Maddox Baston playing at the Old National Events Plaza at 6 p.m. this evening. Uh, Staying in the downtown area, we have a free concert at First Presbyterian Church. Christine Westhoff will sing, and Timothy Allen will accompany her on piano and organ. Performances include works by Mozart, Vivaldi, and Gershwin. That free concert happening at 7 p.m. at First Pres at 2nd and Mulberry Streets here in Evansville. Again, that's Christine Westhoff singing and Timothy Allen accompanying her on piano and organ. Now let's move over to Newburgh. The Tiny Jazz Fest is happening on the Newburgh Riverfront. It's happening both tonight and tomorrow night, beginning at 7 p.m. at the Allen Allen Family Amphitheater on French Island Trail in Newburgh. The fest features Leah Warman and her, her band this evening, and then Caroline Davis and her ensemble performs on Saturday. Attendees can bring blankets, lawn chairs, coolers, that kind of thing, You can also find art by local artists in the nearby Old Lock and Dam building. Again, that's the Tiny Jazz Fest on the Newburgh Riverfront. Tickets are $10, and that covers both nights of the uh, event, Friday and Saturday. The uh, Tiny Jazz Fest starts at 7 p.m. each night. Moving on to Saturday now, the uh, Native Plant Sale is happening at Wesselman Woods. The Indiana Native Plant Society is conducting that sale from 9 a.m. to noon. Should be beautiful weather for uh, for the plant sale and any outdoor activities this weekend. A reminder, do use the temporary entrance off Bakey Road uh, to make your way to Wesselman Woods. That uh, temporary entrance is on Bakey, just north of Swander Ice Arena. Again, the Native Plant Sale at Wesselman Woods will be going on from 9 a.m. until noon. A big event happening tomorrow evening. That's the Front Porch Fest at Haney's Corner. It's Saturday from 3 to 9 p.m. in the Haney's Corner Arts District here in Evansville. The Front Porch Fest is a popular annual free music festival hosted on front porches in the Haney's Corner Arts District. You can see and hear a variety of musicians and genres. Food trucks will also be available. Again, that's the Front Porch Fest at Haney's Corner. It's happening on Saturday from 3 to 9 p.m. in the Haney's Corner Arts District. Lots of music happening there on many porches around the Haney's Corner area. If you have an event that you'd like us to mention on the Weekend Notebook, send it to me via email. That's at jgibson, that's the letter J, G-I-B-S-O-N, at W-N-I-N dot O-R-G, and we'll try to get your event here on the Weekend Notebook. That is going to wrap up the Friday Wrap for this week. I'd like to thank all of our guests, including Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press, also WNIN's Tim Jagalo. A big thanks to WNIN's Kenton McDonald and Indiana Public Broadcasting's Aubrey Wright. Thanks also to Jevin Redman for the sports chat. Thanks again to Kenton McDonald. He also engineered today's show. Thanks to Mariah Winnie for social media support here at WNIN. Also a big thanks to Indiana Public Broadcasting stations and, of course, listeners like you. This is 88.3 WNIN-FM, Evansville, Henderson, and Owensboro. I'm John Gibson, and for this Friday, that's a wrap.